Hello, butlers. In pursuit of B2B greatness, we are often seeking experts who can inspire you to think beyond the grind of filling your pipeline. Not that that is not important, but I have no doubt today that our guest, Matt Salheimer, can do all of that and more. As Vice President and Research Director, Matt leads Forrester's research service for B2B marketing executives. His team's research agenda focuses on vision and envisioning and executing a long-term marketing strategy that drives customer value across six dimensions, many of which we'll cover today. He's also a former multi-time uh, multi-time CMO in the tech industry. So I suspect you'll have a, uh, he can relate and he's certainly walked in the same shoes as you have. So with that, Matt, welcome. How are you and where are you this fine, uh, fine afternoon? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate being here. Um, you hearing me okay? Am I coming through loud and clear? Perfect. Excellent. Good. Uh, so I'm in Texas, in Houston, uh, specifically, where it's rodeo season right now. That means calf roping, mutton busting. If you've not heard that, that's a fun Google. Uh, carnival rides, turkey legs, and concerts. Well, it's a perfect setup for today's conversation <laughs> because, you know, I mean, it feels like marketing today is a lot like sort of roping cows and bucking broncos and some really treacherous moments uh, where one could get gored. So yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> we'll just bring that metaphor all the way through today. Uh, we'll just, we're going to saddle up, I guess. And there we go. So in, um, in our prep call, uh, we outlined a transformative marketing playbook that was designed to meet the transformations we're seeing in the world. So let's start with those transformations that you're seeing. And I, I think we'll start with demographics and, you know, what's happening and why does it matter? Yeah, so indeed, uh, demographics have been shifting, right? Millennials and Gen Z now outnumber my generation, Gen X and the baby boomers in management roles. And uh, in our research that we do around buyer insights, we're finding that there's some interesting differences between these different demographic groups. Uh, younger buyers are more likely to use digital, more likely to use self-serve interaction uh, channels, um, but they still also engage with sales, more likely to engage with inside sales though, um, than the than, uh, face-to-face sales. Um, and you know, older buyers are still favoring more of that enterprise account rep type model. Uh, younger buyers are engaging in a wider type of interaction type, so different marketing interaction types, and they're showing a greater preference for websites and online forums, um, whereas the older buyers still get a lot of their information from vendor salespeople and peers, and they do look at websites too, but there's definitely a balance more for the younger buyers towards digital sources of information. Um, one of the other things that came up in our buyer's journey research that I think you all will find interesting is that younger buyers are more likely to say purchases are stalling or being extended because they were unable to build internal consensus than older buyers. So that may, there may be something there that the younger buyers are having more difficulty in consensus building and communicating the ROI, the projected ROI of, of purchases. Um, and they also tend to need more vendor support to make that business case. So that's a good thing if you're a vendor, right? Engaging with younger buyers, you have a chance to influence the business case more. Uh, so the first thing that I'm excited about is that there's instead of OK Boomer, it's going to be OK Gen X. So we can just move past <laughs> that. I'm excited, actually. You can I can welcome you into my world uh, for for the last 10 years. It's been Indeed. OK Boomer. So, yeah, uh, yeah OK Gen X. Uh, so they these buyers and this is interesting. Yeah, they're digital first. Um, they are inclined. I think you told me a story about your son who's, you know, who was, uh, uh, you know, didn't bother to do one thing. He just sort of went, Oh, I'll look at it on my phone. Boom. Got it, dad. I got this covered. So there's yeah. just an inclination to, uh, uh, to sort of kind of self-serve. Yeah. He was in an auto parts store looking for coolant for his car and trying to text me while I'm in a meeting. And, uh, by the time I got back to him, I was like, go ask the person at the counter. And he was like, oh, I just scanned the QR code on the back of the bottle and it seemed like it meet my needs and I put it in my car. I'm like, there was a person 25 feet away who does this for a living that you could have asked. <laughs> yeah, and that's an interesting implication because we've talked a lot about in huddles about you know, the value of having that product expert and, and so forth. And if this person isn't even gonna talk to, you know, 
interested in talking to the expert, uh, then even more pressure on the salesperson to be ex an expert and more pressure on the marketer to provide that expertise uh, and so forth. So um, let's talk about the implications of, of that, of older, well, th th that we have these younger buyers. Yeah. So, you know, in, in our research, we see older buyers are more likely to rely on prior experience when they're deciding to reach out to a vendor, uh, you know, someone they've worked with, for example, uh, before um, where they, they have an established relationship uh, with that or, you know, maybe a peer of theirs uh, had recommended talking to a particular vendor. But we see with the younger buyers, they're looking for information from industry experts, industry analysts like Forrester, consultants, but they're looking for that information more digitally. Um, and so, you know, you want to make sure that that kind of information, if you're marketing to younger buyers, is available digitally, right? Not just, you know, available through community peer networking, face-to-face, -face, you know, kinds of interactions. Um, so, so vendors can potentially get on the short list more with younger vendors more frequently, which is, you know, good news. Um, but there's also a gotcha. There's a flip side to it. Um, our research shows that younger buyers are more likely to express dissatisfaction with the winning provider, the company they actually choose to purchase from. They're more likely to express dis dissatisfaction, which seems strange, right? Um, you know, that's the winning provider and they're dissatisfied. Um, well, you know, price is usually the most frequently cited reason why people are dissatisfied, whether they're older or younger, right? Like we ended up having to pay more than we wish we would have uh, paid for. But there really are more experiential factors with the younger buyers. Um, they want to see like, you know, is there more competence that's demonstrated during any engagement with sales during the process? Were they able to find the information they were looking for quickly and easily? Um, did they feel like they had a pleasant and productive engagement uh, with the company? So experience seems to carry a significant amount of weight with uh, with younger buyers, they have different expectations of what a good um, purchase process looks like. You know, I, I mean, as you're talking, I'm thinking buyer's remorse is not new. That's right. an old concept. It's been out there. We've all experienced at some point in our lives, whether it was, you know, buying a car, oh God, did I get the wrong model or pay too much or whatever it is. Um, but it feels like what you're saying is that they are more likely to have remorse than the sort of average level of remorse um, mm -hmm. that existed in a purchase. And that obviously has implications for retention, that has implications for onboarding. And so, you know, that I think it's interesting because as you think about customer success and those people, they're going to be walking into this early training and thinking, oh, they're going to be happy, they're ready. But no, they're you're saying they're starting with a deficit. Uh, uh, from the beginning. And that may be an important insight in and of itself. You kind of yeah. got to resell them and re-win them over. Yeah. I mean, a good example of this that we've been talking to clients about recently is in the area of e-commerce. Uh, so there's been sort of a traditional mindset in B2B where we put our lower end products for small to medium businesses online and we keep the enterprise products for the direct reps, right? Um, if I'm a younger buyer in an enterprise company and I go to your website and I see your e-commerce and it's only the small to medium business products. Well, that's not what I need. I'm an enterprise business. So I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to go to one of your competitors. And if they have that capability on their website, on their e-commerce engine, then they're going to go start the pilot, start the trial um, you know, with that other company. And so you've missed the opportunity for any sales engagement at all with that you know, if you take that approach of we're only going to put our lower end products online, for example. So everybody's got to be Amazon. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, in some sense, in, and I'm, I'm being facetious, but if you are offering e-commerce, uh, that's sort of the bar, right? The standard is, uh, you know, I can buy it and it'll arrive tomorrow and, and uh, I can send it back for free. I mean, so I guess that's, that's really interesting is that the expectation and is that just because they're inexperienced or because they've, I mean, have they gotten that somewhere else or other enterprise companies actually providing that option? Option? Well, I think what Amazon first has kind of figured out is they know their audience, right? So they know I make it easy to buy. I make it easy to get it delivered. So therefore I am more inclined to order from Amazon than I am to go to the local store because I know I can get it same day or next day. But they also do a great job on, on returns. 
right? If you ever had to return something through Amazon, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can drop it off even if it's un boxed, unpackaged at the local UPS store or something like that, right? Um, so they really understand their audience. And I think that's the, the main point for B2B marketers to really be thinking about is don't assume you understand how the audience, in this case of e-commerce, wants to transact or don't constrain your thinking to say e-commerce is only going to be for our small to medium business customers. Um, younger buyers want to engage digitally. They want to get started. They want to try before they buy. Um, they want to do a pilot and then maybe expand after the pilot. And if you don't provide your enterprise products uh, through your e-commerce capability, they're going to walk. They're going to go somewhere else. It's as easy as typing in the next URL to go check out the next company's website. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about pilot. We talked about that a lot this month as a, uh, in our conversations about how do you sort of defrost the pipeline. And obviously, if you can get them using with a proof of concept, uh, get them using it. Uh, but there are some folks that don't have the ability to do it because their software requires so much integration. And so those folks are thinking about uh, creating sort of a simulated proof of concept. Uh, now, I want to go back to something earlier and just make sure I understand this correctly. So this audience is not necessarily going to seek out an expert and call them, but they will be way, they will be uh, they will read, they will go find that information on their own online. And if it happens to be from Gartner or Forrester, that's fine. Um, right. right. But they're not going to necessarily pick up the phone and call Gartner or Forrester and say, hey, dudes, what do you think? Or do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're just as likely to go to Reddit um, and, and ask a group of people in a forum on Reddit, who are you using and who do you like using? Right. And get information, you know, that way as uh, to use that as one example. Okay. All right. So. I, I want to get at this idea of of what good looks like <laughs> and what this expectation. So, I mean, every sale and every marketing is about sort of the alignment of expectations. And we talk about this, whether you're working, you know, selling marketing to your CEO or you're selling your product to a customer is sort of needs and expectations being aligned. And what you're describing is this situation where the buying experience defines and sets the tone. And if that experience is painful or doesn't sort of meet the, the millennials expectations or, or the, uh, then you're going to have a problem from day one. Yes. I think that you, you summarized it very well. Like the experience matters more, whereas with older buyers, past history, relationship, working with a provider or vendor matters more. Got it. Okay. Yeah. One other nuance I would throw out there is that um, there seems to be an indication that younger buyers are more open to the, you know, not biggest traditional players in a space. Um, they're more willing to take uh, a chance on a newer emerging, you know, kind of, of vendor. Uh, so that speaks well for uh, innovators and, um, you know, companies that are, you know, going into established markets and trying to differentiate themselves as the, the next generation or next, you know, provider in that particular market segment, that that is something that, that we seem to see some appeal for younger buyers towards those kind of more innovative, newer companies rather than the you know traditional large players in a market. So, you know, we we know that there are buying committees, and at the end of every buying committee, there's this CF no. Right now, we're seeing it across uh, a lot of tech companies, and if I you know haven't actually surveyed 100 plus CMOS and said, hey, you know, is your business up or down? But in the straw polls that we've been doing. Uh, less than 25%, our business is up. And what they're all saying is deals are slowing and it's the CFO who's just saying no, regardless of whether that uh, person who was the, the the buyer, the other people who want it or the department or whatever. So what's, what do we do? What, what's, what's, what's that, um, you know, how's that uh, demographic shift and uh, buying behavior, any thoughts on CF knows and what we do with them? Yeah, I think the demographic shift is less of a key point here as it is the sort of systemic challenge that marketing has as a department within the organization. 
marketing just tends to have more quote fungible dollars uh, than other departments, right? Most other departments have you know money that's tied up in headcount, uh, raw materials, machinery, things with long capitalization periods, and things like that. Whereas if the CFO feels the need to cut budget, and the CEO and board say to the CFO, "Cut budget," marketing is the easiest quote place to go to because it's less painful to cut some of those dollars, or at least that's the perception that a lot of CFOs think. Um, and so that's just sort of a systemic challenge, I think, that marketing has to just accept the reality of. Uh, but more than that, I think that the bigger challenges in a period of economic uncertainty, like we continue to operate in, the ability to articulate the impact that purchases are going to make. And, and what I suggest here is kind of thinking about dual tracking the impact. Uh, so how will this improve, uh, improve efficiency, but also how will it help drive, you know, new customer acquisition or support existing customer uh, retention? So you're, you're able to make a dual pronged or dual track argument to the CFO. Um, the, the more you can go in with arguments on both sides, the, the stronger your position is going to be. If you just go in with, well, this is going to help us add more customers, then that's going to put a lot more pressure on demonstrating the business case and the model and signing up for the revenue numbers. If you just go in with efficiency, um, you know, that may be, you know, something that the CFO is receptive to, but they may say, okay, great. It's going to make you more efficient. So I'm going to take some dollars out as well right um, and so if you if you can dual track it and say this is going to help us become more efficient in the way in which we acquire new customers or it's going to help us become more efficient in retaining or cross-selling or expanding customers then you put yourself in a better uh, better position the other thing I would add uh, drew is that you know another piece of advice we've been giving to our clients is don't forget about innovation and experimentation as well. And that seems to be the one thing that marketers are feeling the most pressure in the current environment to sort of give up on. Um, but it's innovation and experimentation that helps you with the next breakthrough, right? It helps you get that next, you know, improvement in your marketing cost of acquisition, uh, you know, for example. Um, and so it, it can be hard, though, <laughs> to show Innovation is efficiency, right? Because inherently when you're innovating, it's new, right? Um, and it also can be difficult to stand behind an ROI projection on an experiment, right? It's an experiment. Um, and so what we're recommending is that, and again, tying into the CF no, CFO personality style is to think like a venture capitalist. Uh, so if you if you know how venture capitalists work, right, they have a fund um, and they do a variety of different investments in different companies and they promise their investors that they're going to get a certain return. But they don't say you're going to get a return from company X of this and a return from company Y of this. They say across the fund, you're going to get a return. And so we've been advising our CMO clients to think like that, think like a VC and say, here's a basket of ideas, experiments. And collectively, we're going to drive this amount of impact on revenue or this amount of impact on customer retention. But don't sign up for the ROI on an individual experiment, because that way, if one or two of those experiments don't plan out, pay out the way you expect them to be, you can still hopefully deliver the ROI for the, the entire you know, basket of ideas. Yeah. And I, I love the portfolio thinking and the approach. And, you know, it's funny, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about internal CFOs. I was more thinking about selling to, uh, oh, okay. you know, but that's okay. Well, but this is really an important topic and I think pro perhaps more relevant to, to our audience anyway. So I guess the question is, so you start the year as a CMO, you get the CFO to approve a budget of whatever that is. And we've convinced them that there's a portfolio of programs that are going to deliver X, Y, Z that you agree on, whether that, you know, whether that's a certain number of coverage for the sales folks or whatever metrics it, and we'll get to that in a second. I guess the question is, and, and uh, two questions. First question is how then say, but you know what, if we did one more thing and added this stock to the portfolio and we, we got to uh, Magellan Fund, we got to find that 10 bagger. I think this is the 10 bagger we want to add to the portfolio. At that moment, the CFO is going to say, well, what's the payout on that particular one? And so, because it's additive, right? And so is there yeah. any way around that? Because you mentioned experimenting and innovation and often the base budget is blocking and tackling. Right. So, you know, there's no perfect solution for that. Um, you know, 
different CMOs have tried different approaches. You know, they've got a hold back, for example, that they keep at their level in the budget that they don't give out to their direct reports, right? And so when one of those ideas emerges or when something maybe requires a little extra funding than what was originally anticipated, the, the CMO can allocate, uh, you know, dollars out from that particular holdback. Um, that's one strategy uh, that, you know, many CMOs have had some success with. But a lot of it also comes down to what's the decision authority in the organization, right? Um, you know, sometimes CMOs have less purchase authority uh, than you know they really should have, right? You know, if if you work in an organization where every PO over 50k, for example, has to go in front of your CFO, um, that can result in a lot more scrutiny than if every PO over a quarter million has to go in right. front of the the, the CFO. Um, you know, the one strategy to deal with that challenge is to talk about agility um, and about how, you know, if the purchase authority is set too low and the CMO is not trusted as an equal member of the C-suite to have a more high uh, purchase authority, then it's going to slow down the marketing organization and the marketing organization needs to be agile and responsive. Um, and that, that argument can sometimes be successful. But the add one thing mid-year, especially if it's unbudgeted, is a tough one, especially because a lot of those add one thing in the middle of the years are usually a multi-year investment. Like, you know, I think here of like, you know, doing a, a marquee sponsorship, for example, um, you know, you're not going to see the ROI of that in, in that year. Right. You're right. going to see that ROI in a multi-year uh, capacity um, or a multi-year time horizon. So you're going to have to think about how to build a business case to to justify the investment that's going to have to have a now before the ROI kicks in, the payback kicks in. Yeah, I like again, if we take the stock portfolio notion and we say we want to add this level of agility to that and say, you know what, this stock isn't performing the way it is. We're going to yank it out and replace it. You know the the CMO needs that that yeah. sort of the the ability to do that. Yeah, I used to use a rule of thumb as a practicing CMO, where I would tell my CFO and CEO that I'm trying to manage the marketing organization as close as I can get to an 85-15 budget model, where with 85% of the budget, I can deliver my commitments to the business, the pipeline commitments in particular to the business. The other 15% is my experimentation and upside budget right that's how i help us exceed plan right and you know the ceo wants to exceed plan let's be clear right right the cfo wants to exceed plan so i i've kind of tried to isolate a little bit as a practitioner that and firewall off that 15 percent to say you know give me the freedom to use that 15 percent however i see fit i'm still going to meet my commitment to the business with the rest of the budget but that 15 percent holdback gives me the ability to bring upside for the business to help us exceed our revenue plan that makes a lot of sense to me i know from experience that of uh, cmos who have done that have found that that's the first budget that gets taken away from them that's the that that is the slippery slope of that. Yes. And so I'm glad you called that out. There is a risk there. So you have to be the judge of what's the right. sort of current uh, mindset within the organization. If you're operating in an environment where you and I were talking about this during the prep call, where one of the the huddle members shared with you that, you know, they were told your targets are going up by 30% and your budget's going down by 20%. How do I close that 50% gap? Yeah, probably saying I'm reserving 15% of my budget for experimentation and nothing may come of it. That's probably not going to be a successful communication strategy in that scenario. Yeah, yeah. Not, a, not in that one. And I mean, again, I like the idea of labeling a part of budget with sort of added growth, extra right. growth and so forth. I just can see how, well, if you know what's going to work so well, why not you know, and this is just such a tricky part of it because most CEOs and most CFOs want a sense of dollar in equals dollar out. Right. And what we're really saying is, no, we're saying stock portfolio will equal growth. You understand that concept because you own a bunch of different stocks. That's what we have here. Yeah, and marketing is much more of a, a an exponential or compounding function than let's say sales, right? And so I think to your your last comment, you know, a lot of CFOs and CEOs have become attuned to the idea. You know, I come from the tech industry, from the software space, right? So two million dollar quota per sales reps fairly common, right? So 
you know, and, and, you know, 60% of reps don't make their quota. And on average, they'll make, you know, 1.2 million of their 2 million quota or 1 million of their 2 million quota. And so they have a mathematical model that they can feed into and they can say, if I hire this many reps, I'll get this amount of revenue out of the, out of that. And it's difficult for marketing to be able to create that sort of a simple model because of the way in which marketing can really impact the business is multivariable and it's multi-year, right? So we do, we try to use um, with our clients, the, the guidance of compounding benefits. And we talk about brand in this context, for example, right? If you choose to pull back on your brand spend to save some money in the short term, in theory, to save some money in the short term, you're not just losing the impact of that spend in year one, you're losing the compound effect of that in year two and year three and year four. I mean, imagine if you said, I'm going to stop putting money in my 401k this year right. for the rest of the year, right? That's not going to just impact me this year, right? That's going to impact me forever, right? Um, and brand works the same way. Brand investments work the same way. And so, you know, trying to use analogies like that can yeah. help um, with CFOs. Um, another kind of semi-humorous one that I've used before is, um, most CFOs have owned and sold a house before, right? Um, and so they've done some some painting and some sprucing up of the landscape before they've sold the house, right? And every good realtor is going to recommend you do those things, right? So ask the CFO, well, when you sold the house and you got the contract, how much of the contract was for um, the landscaping that you did and the and the painting that you did? Well, you know, of course, it doesn't work that way. There's just a purchase price on the contract, right? right? Well, brand is much the same way as well, right? Like you're not going to be able to isolate, you know, every brand activity to a specific contribution to increasing the purchase price, you know, in this analogy uh, on a house. It just, it doesn't work that way. How much did that smelling that fresh baked bread go into the purchase price? Who <laughs> exactly. knows? No, it's it's a great, and I, I I feel like there's a whole suite of financial analogies that can help. Uh, and I I I see a post coming uh, on this, so we'll, but let's keep going. We promised a few transformative things for ideas for CMOs. And it's sort of regardless of economic conditions, because we may, you know, second half of 2024 may lift everybody because interest rates go down or they may stay flat. And, and if they do, it's going to be tough. So what do we do? So, well, on the subject we were just talking about on brand, bond brand with demand. Uh, be really ruthless about making sure that how you're doing brand activities reinforce and provide lift to your demand activities. Make sure the messaging is very aligned between your brand level and your brand promise and the demand themes that you're putting in market from a campaign standpoint. That's that's one thing that you can do to make sure that brand is seen as not separate and disjointed, but is seen as a driver to demand. Another thing that we're guiding our clients to do is really to open the aperture of marketing's remit. So to, to go beyond new logo acquisition, which many organizations are still very focused on and their CEOs and CFOs and boards are asking them to focus on, to, to really embrace retention and expansion marketing. And it's critical to not leave out the retention aspect. Um, because a retained customer is the foundation for expansion, right? If you don't have a happy customer who's realizing value, they're not going to want to expand their investment with you. Um, and, and marketers sometimes forget that or they delegate that and they think, okay, customer success and sales are going to worry about retention. I'll just focus on new logo acquisition and expansion um, because that's how a lot of demand marketers just naturally have come up in their experience, right? But retention is actually very critical. And, and so if your CMO dashboard doesn't have gross retention rate and net revenue retention rate and things like that on it, it really should uh, because marketing plays a, a critical role in, in influencing those metrics as well. I know we're going to get to metrics a little bit more uh, later, but there's a relationship obviously. Uh, between yeah, these no, I, I, I love it. Okay. So we're going to bond brand and demand. And in part of that is, is, is using this language of compounding, thinking about it as a stock portfolio. And then we're going to get them to recognize that and get everybody to agree. And this is going to be education and training and so forth that we're not just looking at net new logo as our, and what the pipeline is uh, behind that net new logo. Okay. So that's one. Yeah. Now what about, I guess we could talk about organizational models. What, uh, what, what else do we want to look at? Yeah. So let's talk about org. So, you know, in a word, I think what we're hearing most from CMOs right now is agile. 
how do I be more agile? I mentioned that, you know, earlier in terms of positioning, you know, purchases with your, with your CFO. Um, marketers have done a great job, B2B marketers over the last 10 plus years of building a lot of domain expertise in different areas, right? Whether that's messaging or campaign planning or program execution or website development or influencer relations. But in the process of doing that, we've actually created a lot of silos within our own organizations. I know silos is one of those words that gets thrown around and used all the time, break down the silos, right? But there's truth in it, right? There's a reason why it's trite, um, because there's truth in it. Um, what we're guiding our clients to do, we take a very customer-centric approach at Forrester. And so what we're saying is start with your audience and really focus on your audience and build a team that's audience aligned across those different functions. Um, there's this concept in DevOps, for those of you that are in tech, uh, the tech industry have heard of the term DevOps before. There's this concept called two pizza teams, um, where the idea is you want your team to be large enough that they can get some real work done, but small enough that they don't get bogged down. So, you know, the, the size of a team that could have a meal with two pizzas is kind of the ideal size team. Uh, so think about that notion of a two pizza team. What would that look like around a particular audience or particular segment? Who would you need from product marketing and portfolio marketing around marketing? market intelligence and messaging and competitive positioning? Who would you need from public relations? Who would you need from campaign planning? Who would you need from marketing operations around data and systems right. and things like that? And build that audience-centric team. Some organizations call them pods, uh, but we think of them as audience-centric, sort of self-sufficient teams. It's such a different approach than I think most uh, marketers have because they sort of have centers of excellence. We've got the we got the content team and and we've got the demand gen team and we've got quote the digital team, which it could be digital advertising, it could be websites of. Um, you've got a brand brand team, you know, and those are sort of centers of excellence, mm -hmm. um, but they're not necessarily cross disciplined and they're not necessarily helping you uh, get your sort of mind around in a group around how do we really engage a particular audience uh, well. So that's that's interesting. Do you know any companies that are actually doing that? Yeah, in fact, uh, we do have clients that are doing that. And one of the things that they say that they really like about it is they don't have to reorg to do it, right? Um, uh, because you know they still have the functional teams and the functional reporting structures, but they're overlaying a horizontal layer uh, that's audience centric. and. I often talk about how in um, many organizations, product centricity is a big challenge, right? We, 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 we tend to have this muscle memory within organizations because the P&L is structured around products to think inside out. Marketing has to be the counterweight to that. Marketing has to be the, the organization that brings the audience in. Um, right. Um, and so if marketing is organizing campaigns around products, then it's, it's, it's not, doing its job as effectively as it could. And so this approach of taking an audience centric team and empowering them in a self-sufficient way, but not forcing a reorg uh, in the sense of pulling people out of their you know, traditional HR functional reporting structures is definitely resonating with our clients. Yeah. And it feels like in some ways that happens probably in an ABM thing, because you bring in the sales guys and we say, but it's not quite because you're really defining it based on a certain group. And I love the distinction between what you're selling and who you're selling to. It feels like close to what uh, Liz Weissman was talking about in Impact Players, this notion of team of teams. Yes. Is you, you bring in those folks in. Okay. So, all right, metrics. Mm -hmm. We talked about, and, I, and again, I feel this pain in almost every huddle is when we talk about metrics, you know, pipeline, 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 pipelines. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels like um, that, in, and they can never for a second take their mind off and they got to solve what all the problems are, but it feels like it closes the aperture of the job. Yes. Right. So talk a little bit about rethinking metrics. Well, I'll confess one of the advantages of being a research director here at Forrester is I don't have to carry a pipeline number. <laughs> Um, you know, I've carried a pipeline number for many, many years and, and most years was able to hit or overachieve that, um, which I'm very proud of, but, you know, it takes a lot of effort, obviously, to, to get there. And, and like you said, it can really drive a myopia around the thinking about marketing's contribution, right, uh, to the business. So we're not going to do away 
uh, with pipeline completely, right? It's still very important and and tying you know marketing impact to revenue uh, as well. But there are, there are other things that are important. Um, and so what we typically suggest to our clients is they take a layered measurement approach. So don't just focus on or allow marketing uh, to be focused on one or two metrics, but think about other metrics, like I mentioned earlier, like gross retention and net revenue retention, which are important to the business or should be important to the business, right? How does marketing impact those metrics? Um, how does marketing contribute to um, rising all boats through brand health, right? Um, we, we, we define brand in terms of awareness, perception and preference, right? Do people recognize who you are as a, as a name? Do they perceive what you do accurately? And is there preference for your brand in the, in the marketplace? And marketing absolutely is in the driver's seat around that. And, and you know, your sales colleague, your chief revenue officer, chief sales officer is an ally there because they're usually one of the first to speak up and say, we don't have enough brand uh, awareness. So we don't have enough brand uh, perception and brand uh, accurate brand perception and, and uh, enough brand preference. Um, so turn that what might sometimes be seen as a deficit into uh, a flip side to say, great, well, you know, I'm going to start reporting out on those metrics and I'm going to start investing to drive those metrics up over time. But that means you've got to make a commitment to measurement um, on an ongoing basis. You know, you can't just do a one-off brand study. You need to do that consistently, at least every two years, if not every year, uh, to be able to look at your awareness, your perception, and and your preference in your target uh, markets. And then one of the other areas that we see that shows up in our research, a lot of organizations are looking to the partner ecosystem to drive growth. And, and I think part of that is an efficiency play, right? The perception that, you know, going to market with channel partners is more efficient, embedding others' technology into our offering, for example, um, helps us to avoid, you know, R&D cost, uh, for example. So how are you capturing marketing's contribution to the partner ecosystem and how marketing is driving the partner ecosystem as part of a QBR or board meeting or on your regular dashboards that you look at, you know, not just from a revenue and a pipe standpoint, but partner recruiting, partner enablement, the productivity demand programs that you're enabling uh, partners uh, with uh, and capture those metrics and communicate those as well. One thing you didn't mention is employees. Hmm. And the impact of sort of brand on employees and their sense of satisfaction and pride in uh, in in marketing that you know let's face it every any brand that's ever had a commercial on the Super Bowl every employee comes back and they just has this sense that they're they're walking higher the next on the Monday after the game because there they were right yeah. there's a it's an incredible thing to see so but you didn't include it in there and, and I'm just curious why. Yeah, that's perceptive of you to call me out on that. Um, it actually is part of our research. Um, we actually published a report last year on the CMO's role in the employee value proposition and how that's something the CMO shouldn't cede to HR uh, to take uh, sole ownership over. Um, and you're absolutely right. Brand you know, can have a huge impact on employee retention, uh, recruiting. Um, brand also is very important in terms of your employees as advocates for your brand, right? You know, that's one of, you know, for a long time, I've maintained that one of the least expensive brand development strategies you can have is making sure that everybody in your company knows what your brand promises and consistently communicates that in the market, right? Um, you know, if you're in a, co a company of a thousand employees or 10,000 employees or 50,000 employees, those are all potential brand marketers uh, for you in the, in the, in the market. Uh, truth be told, we're just not hearing about it as much from clients in the last year or so. I think as the employment market has gotten tougher, um, there has been less of that focus on ensuring that we're driving employee, or brand, employee branding and we're building a strong brand from a recruiting standpoint. Um, and so that's why I didn't mention it, right. Um, right. but it, it, it is important. Um, it's just not getting as much interest and attention right now, given the current labor market. Well, all of those metrics, and if we had them for a moment, I sort of, the, if we had sort of two, five now, we have employees, customers, prospects, partners, right? And then brand as an overlay across all four of those, if you will. Um, what you're saying is that the job is a lot bigger than demand. 
Yes. And this is where this is the risk that's out there right now is the job gets shrinked to demand. At which point in time you don't hit the numbers because the economy's not good and you know unfortunately you you are looking for your next opportunity because or, the so and I just wonder mm -hmm. if helping the organization define the metrics and then tracking and delivering against those broader metrics is a path to a little more job security I don't know you tell me I I, I believe it is because if you if you play out where you were going what what we've seen happen in a number of different companies is the demand marketing piece gets rolled up under the CRO, and then there is a brand and comms leader that you know or to CEO, but oftentimes end up reporting to a COO, and they don't have a CMO any longer. Um, so so broadening the aperture of how marketing contributes to the business, broadening the the, the metrics that are being communicated in QBRs and in board meetings is a job security strategy for sure. Yeah. And in educating the folks along the way of why all these pieces um, sort of matter. And it's so funny because every salesperson who goes to a company that wasn't well known and that graduate, and suddenly they knock on a door, if you will, metaphorically. And somebody said, Oh, I've heard of you guys. That moment, that salesperson goes, Oh my God, you have. Yeah. <laughs> It's and the difference is like a friendly hello versus who the hell are you? Yeah. Right. And so uh yeah, there are you there are some advocates. And the funniest thing is I, I always know when suddenly you hear of a company that that is gonna launch a brand campaign, it's mainly because a CEO went somewhere and they said, Where do you work? And they say the name of the company and they haven't heard of it, and then suddenly the CEO front and center feels, Oh my god, nobody's heard of us. We need to fix that. <laughs> Well, and where I come from in the tech industry, a lot of times brand campaigns at the CEO mindset um, are translated into category leadership campaigns, right? Like, so we're going to go, we're going to go define this new category and position ourselves as the only company or the leader in that particular company. I was actually just talking with a CMO earlier this week that said that they then took all of marketing and pivoted behind that category without doing the market research to really know and understand that their audience didn't care about that category. The audience cared about problems and challenges, not you know this particular you know category that they were trying to advance in the marketplace. And they actually shot themselves in the foot uh, in the process and revenue declined uh, because they pivoted the marketing engine over to something that was a new and emerging concept that language that you know buyers weren't really using and i can think of my own uh, career where i helped to stop something like that from happening i remember vividly a conversation with my ceo in a former company i worked for who said hey we need to position ourselves in this category and i said let me show you the google search volume <laughs> for that particular category right now um, and I showed it to him and I was like, if you want, we can pivot a lot of spend over there. There's not a lot of buyers there. So let's look at this as a journey where we're continuing to invest around this category and these terms and these markets while we start to build the beachhead from a thought leadership standpoint in this new market. And then we can decide when's the right time to flip and put more emphasis on that new market. But if we go all in on the category right now, we're going to lose revenue and we're going to lose our client base because our clients are going to say, you're no longer focused on the thing I bought you for. Right, 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 right. Okay, so we've outlined a number of things that in theory will be transformative. One is this sort of portfolio approach where one way or another, you've got 15% of your money and sort of experimentation, your innovation, your things there. Um, By the way, I strive to strive for 15. Right? You yeah, don't always, no, I, yeah, I yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. know, minimum 10, get to yeah. 15. But there's also the case that these you know, what happens is like webinars were killing it two years ago and they're not working now. And if you don't have a plan B that you've been testing, yeah, you know, you're kind of, you're, 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 you're in trouble. Okay. So we've got the, the, the portfolio approach. We've got marrying brand and demand. We've got broadening the aperture of metrics. We've got this notion of customer centric teams that are going, putting together campaigns, um, and we have a no new broader dashboard. It's funny because almost everything is is again about broadening the aperture. We haven't talked about Gen AI. Obviously, that's changing everything. Let's just get a quick sort of thought on you how you're thinking about this relative to CMOs and and, and what they should be doing uh, to drive the business forward. 
Well, actually, I wrote my remarks for this huddle using Gen AI. Uh, <laughs> no, just just kidding. Yes. Just kidding. But yes. you probably would have believed me, or at least some of you might have believed me if I said that was the case. Um, but all kidding aside, you know, Forrester is actually taking a very different approach with Gen AI than we have for other significant tech trends. Uh, in the past, the Forrester uh, line has basically been let the early adopters go first. Let them learn some things, you know, have some failures, have some successes, and then you want to be in the early mainstream. Uh, we're not saying that with Gen AI. We're saying this is this has the potential to be truly transformative. You need to start working on it now. But it's important that you still do a readiness assessment. You got to understand, like, why are you doing it? What are the goals and objectives you're trying to achieve? Um, what sort of governance and policies are you going to put around this? Um, what technology base do you already have to work from? There's a lot of Gen AI capabilities that vendors already have that, you know, in your tech stack and your MarTech stack that they probably already have that you could start doing some experimentation with rather than going out and starting a whole process of acquiring uh, net new uh, providers. But data is really critical. Um, you know, anybody that's spent much time in this space knows that these large language models, they crave huge amounts of data because basically they're probability models, right? So they need data, they need information to see the patterns, to figure out the patterns in order to produce the, the recommendations. And then the last part of readiness is really down to skills. Um, and what we're advising clients is don't let it be a free for all where you're just sort of letting your whole marketing team go and experiment with Gen AI. You probably want to put some guardrails around it. You probably want to say like, these are specific use cases we're going to go after. These are the teams that we're chartering with those use cases. Otherwise, you know, back to the efficiency conversation, there's, there's a real potential for distraction here. Uh, where people are taking their eye off of the day-to-day, -day, the, the the core, the baseline that they need to get across the finish line because they're excited about the new Gen AI stuff, right? Marketers love new tech. They lo love new things. So you got to find that right balance in your organization. But we're definitely saying go all in on on Gen AI. Don't don't wait. It's interesting. I, I, I want to, my I'm wrestling because there's funny, there's in, in our community, there are folks who are just saying, go play. Go solve problems. It, it, figure out how to use it and 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 report back. Your notion of guardrails and use cases. The challenge that I have right now with that is, the use cases seem to come out every day. <laughs> that there's a new way. So part of it's technology. Part of someone's figured out how to do it. Right. They married mm -hmm. this with that, and so. The, the notion of a bunch of people in the playpen trying to solve the problem, because it's unclear right now, is there a problem that it can't solve? And the answer is, we don't know yet. So how do you, how would a CMO figure out what use cases they should and shouldn't be applying Gen AI to right now? So start with your goals, right? What are you trying to achieve as a marketing organization? And then in that context, how can Gen AI be relevant? Don't just go on a fishing expedition, right? Tie it back to your goals uh, that are important. So if one of your goals is to provide more content to support your segmentation strategy, for example, uh, let's say you want to be able to be more effective in going to market from a vertical industry perspective. Great. Then content creation using Gen AI around industry uh, content is a, is a great idea to go, to go run with an experiment and say, okay, let's take some existing assets and, uh, and have Gen AI figure out what would that look like if we tailored it to a healthcare company or an insurance company or a government entity. But then this is where the second order questions start to come up. Well, if you don't have the industry expertise in your team, how do you know what Gen AI is recommending is actually good? I mean, there's the obvious example of HIPAA spelled with two Ps in healthcare, right? We right. all know that one and we laugh about it, right? Uh, but it's harder uh, to find some of the the other things where Gen AI spits out something that looks reasonable, right? But it may not be reasonable. So, you know, you probably do need to have somebody on your staff, maybe somebody in your sales organization or a consultant on retainer that can review some of the kinds of materials that, are, that Gen AI is producing to make sure that they are accurate and, and you know, uh, are going to resonate with your target audience. You still get the efficiency gain out of it. Um, but the idea of sort of like, we're just going to leave it to AI, I think is, it's not, it's not a panacea. It's right. a, um, it's a real risky strategy. Yeah. I, I, so I, I'm just going to paint, throw this out and then we'll, we're going to wrap up. So 
we have a community of you know several hundred uh, B2B CMOs. And here's what I would love. I would love for Gen AI to be able to go through all of the conversations and all of the data so that every time we communicate with a CMO, we know exactly what it is, what industry they're in, what uh, what they care about, what they thought about, and that we're connecting them um, with others who have like challenges. And, and it feels like we're at that moment where you could have a smart technology, read the transcripts, you could have, you know, the data opportunities, you talked about it. There's yeah. an opportunity that AI can go in and sort this data out. Um, just that alone, this notion of really mass personalization uh, and so that you can create a sense of relevance, right, in everything that you do to to your prospect. Anyway, it's a hard try. It's it's so much, and and if you if you think about it too bigly, too big, um, you, you might not be able to get some of the just like make a podcast faster, right? Well, so here's a good example, and I think okay. it's a transition to where you, we wanted to close out on things. Right. Um, so we have our big uh, conference for B2B marketers, sales, and product management professionals coming up in May in Austin at the beginning of May. Um, when we were thinking about planning the tracks and keynotes for that event, we have a lot of data about you know, what reports are people downloading uh, from Forrester? Uh, what uh, guidance session requests are we getting from clients on various different topics? So we used... Uh, ChatGPT, our internal ChatGPT, to analyze all of that data and come back with recommendations on what should our tracks look like, uh, what should our keynotes look like. But then we still married that with human subject matter experts, right? And we said, okay, this is what AI is suggesting. How do we feel about what's being suggested from AI? What would we augment to it? How would we tweak it? So it's the future is really about human and machine. It's not about human versus machine or human or machine. Augmentation, yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, I'm so upset I'm not going to be able to be there with you in Austin. I was there last year. It was an incredible conference. Really, really smart people. Some great, great sessions. A lot of forward thinking thing. You described it as Woodstock for marketing nerds. I love that. Uh, <laughs> but for the younger uh, for, buyers, it's Coachella. It's Coachella, yeah, and even that, yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. And even Coachella might be too old. Uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, they call. I think the big one now for the younger generation is EDC, the Electric Daisy Carnival. All right, so <laughs> it's the EDC for for marketing nerds. Yeah. Great. Um, and your theme this year? Align, reinvent, win. Align marketing, sales, product. Reinvent how you're approaching working together, and reinvent how you're engaging with your audiences, and you'll win. Awesome. All right. Uh, anything else that uh, we'll put the link uh, in 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 the. Uh, chat here, but also anything else that folks should know about um, the event in Austin? Yeah. So for Summit, the one thing I would say to this group, because of the seniority of this group, is we have a separate executive leadership experience at Summit. So you get more peer work networking opportunities with folks at your level. You get a curated agenda. Um, there's breakfasts and lunches and things like that. Um, there's keynote speakers coming and speaking to the executive leadership exchange in a more intimate setting. So you have a chance to ask questions and things like that. So we, we definitely try to curate back to staying close to your audience, try and create more of an elevated experience for our CMO level attendees. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up with two do's and one don't for B2B CMOs when it comes to driving transformation. So do number one, get closer to your audience and adopt an audience centric rather than a product centric marketing strategy across the whole life cycle of the customer. Do number two, take Gen AI seriously. And then don't keep letting marketing's value be defined solely based on pipeline metrics. Amen to that. Love that. <laughs> uh, Matt Selheimer, thank you so much for joining us. It really has been a, a treat to talk to you. Pleasure. Thanks for inviting me and great talking to you today as well, Drew.